My name is Brian Colwell. I'm the co-founder and CTO of Headspin. Um, my talk today is about a process that we developed at Headspin to help mobile teams uh, collect the data that they need to make good decisions to continually improve their user experience. So I'm assuming most people here are app developers or part of a mobile team. Um, and I'm guessing that uh, one of your goals is to deliver a high quality user experience to all your users. So no matter where they open the app, anywhere in the world, uh, making sure they have a great experience. Um, what most teams find challenging is that uh, once their app launches or they're launching new features on a continuous basis, uh, they're struggling to kind of keep keep that quality high. So I know when I launch an app, I'm continually watching the the stars and the app the app store, seeing you know how they're fluctuating day to day and trying to trying to collect issues that seem important um, to fix, um, and constantly fixing what seem like the highest priority issues. Um, one place that's natural for teams to start uh, once their app is live, or even before they launch their app, is actually starting with the, the cloud. So the APIs and the content that powers the app. So um, you can start adding instrumentation, logging, events uh, to track how the API is performing, how the content's being served. Um, and this is a, a natural starting point. You can collect a lot of data by adding you know, hooks on your, on your server side. When you get to the user side, or the, the phone that the user is using out in the wild, um, you can add some analytics. But typically, developers find it's hard to instrument too much on the user side, because the amount of data being collected on the user side adversely affects uh, the user experience. So the more data you collect, the more user data uh, you use, the more battery you use. It's really hard, for example, to upload too many screenshots or too, too much verbose logging from a, from a user device. Also, um, when users use your app, um, they're in a bunch of different uh, conditions. So they're uh, opening it in different, different uh, network conditions, different environments. And it's really hard to get a repeatable user flow or a clean user flow across with enough data to actually test and uh, debug uh, what's going on. Um, so it has been what we focused on is a process that uh, sort of inverts the amount of data uh, to put more data from the user perspective for developers. So um, the user perspective is the join point between uh, everything that, um, that powers the app. So between the internet services, the network, the app code, uh, your APIs, it all shows up on the user. Um, but typically, this has been the hardest point to get the, the high fidelity data you need to, uh, to make decisions. But once you have uh, rich user data, um, you can actually start prioritizing decisions and making better informed decisions uh, and, and being more measured about how you're um, fixing your app and um, what you're prioritizing. So uh, in our process, when we think of high fidelity user data, uh, we think of five areas. So what the user sees on the screen, um, what the user hears and what the user says into the into the device, um, which is becoming more important as uh, voice interfaces are becoming more common. The cell and the Wi-Fi networks that the device sees, uh, the user input, um, how the user is actually touching the device, how they're interacting with the device, and also what's happening inside the device in the uh, GPU and the CPU. So. Um, to, under, to capture this high fidelity data, uh, what we focus on um, in our process is actually these four data sets, um, which capture enough, uh, enough of this user experience to actually make meaningful analytics um, uh, of the user. So the first is the high quality 60 frames per second video of the screen. Uh, this is very important uh, to start developing um, AI models about how the, what the user is seeing, the content, how the content's changing. Um, Bi-directional audio in and out of the device at the operating system level. So uh, this is really important as apps, uh, for example, start from a Siri experience and sort of transition into an app and then back into a Siri or a, sorry, Google Assistant. Um, uh, all the packets uh, from, from the, the app user space. So uh, going out over the real cell networks or the real Wi-Fi networks, um, you see a lot of um, richness on the client side that can't be seen on the server side. 
um, the client side captures all the data about how the app's actually using the network, how the the network is affecting the app, uh, which which can't really be measured uh, anywhere but the but what the what the device sees on the network, and also the user input. So the user is the one driving the app, um, and there's a lot of richness and subtlety in that input. There's a lot of best practices on how input should be reflected and how the app performs. That um, without the the high fidelity user input, it's hard to, to track back um, what the user is actually experiencing. So uh, to get at this, this high fidelity data sets, these four data sets, um, we actually uh, spent a lot of time building out um, a new type of data center, a new distributed data center um, with the reliability and the scale um, of a real data center or sort of a single location or uh, you know, concrete building data center. Uh, so we started with a unique uh, RF neutral plastic uh, wind tunnel design. Um, so if when you're using real devices, bloating um, temperature control is really important. So anytime you're uh, running a device farm, it's, it's basically a best practice to keep them a lot of wind going through the device. It'll extend the life of the device. It'll let you run, you know, at higher load, and also let you run at room temperature. Um, which um, if you're if you're really focusing on distributing. A data center uh, room temperature was very important for us to uh, to be able to put this in uh, in areas without uh, temperature control. Um, so we also focused on designing uh, custom servers that uh, sit in this box that run at above room temperature. Um, so there's a lot of uh, sort of work in this area. For example, Wi-Fi AP deployments, you know, running sort of servers out there in like really extreme conditions. So we. Uh, we built some servers similar to those type of environments to let us run sort of high processing power at room temperature um, within these boxes. Uh, we also custom built USB hubs that let us uh, finally control the sync and the, the power to the devices. Um, uh, we embedded uh, custom Bluetooth um, headsets within the, uh, within the box that creates a, a bi-directional um, audio communication with all the devices in the box. Uh, so 24 devices fit in this box. Uh, and then um, typically when you have a real data center, uh, the thing uh, that you really like are smart hands. So people are actually in the data center 24-7 um, available to, to do tasks. So if, if you're talking about taking devices out of a data center um, uh, to start collecting this, this, this really valuable data, uh, one of the things you'll, you'll start missing most immediately is actually the smart hands. There's no one there you know, to do anything with the device if something goes wrong. And typically, this is where um, uh, a lot of uh, reliability issues start to creep up, because essentially, over time, devices drop off or sort of become um, you know, unavailable. So we actually built out um, an automatic smart hands that sits within the box. Uh, we call it an e-finger. And um, it can do manual maintenance on the devices um, remotely. So we, uh, we can deal with MDMs, which are becoming uh, more important uh, on devices. So um, security rules where your IP needs to be pin locked, for example, or you know, pin locks popping uh, automatically on devices are becoming uh, more common. Um, and we can also do reflashing or sort of any type of uh, maintenance um, on, a, on a device with our uh, e-finger. E so um, all this was a new way of thinking about a device cloud um, that uh, is a massively distributed um, but maintains 24-7 uptime um, and, and chain of custody on the devices. Um, this also has a, a touchscreen um, system that tracks who, who takes devices out. Um, so, so this is where we started uh, to try to get out this data set. Um, and what we did is we basically put these boxes all over the world. So uh, we have boxes in uh, six continents, uh, everything but uh, Antarctica, um, over 100 major cities around the world. Um, we have real devices um, running on real cell networks, um, running workloads, um, and, and essentially in enabling this type of uh, user experience um, monitoring um, to, to help developers um, prioritize problems and understand you know, what's actually happening in their apps. So um, about three years ago, we started um, this, uh, this process with our devices and with our uh, deployment that we call mapping the experience genome. 
So uh, we wanted to understand where uh, the user experience problems were happening in the apps and how those correlate to user groups. So um, a lot of app developers are um, familiar with uh, running a user group and getting feedback from real, real users. This is incredibly hard to do at scale. It's incredibly hard to do continuously. Um, but we thought that you know, if we understood what, what the elements were of feedback, when people say, you know, I, don't, I didn't enjoy this app experience, if we could build AI models that would automatically uh, characterize the app experience and give feedback to uh, developers on a continuous basis, um, we could uh, use, use these models to essentially guide, guide mobile teams um, to, to fix the issues and understand you know, what the users are seeing. So um, we, broke, we broke down the genome into uh, two, two types of issues. So um, um, the first uh, we call user experience issues. So um, these are the issues that uh, pretty much anyone could tell you is an issue. So it's very uh, layman uh, language. Uh, it's, it's anyone could, could understand a user experience issue. Uh, how we built these issues are, um, we actually just spoke with a lot of users and, and ran a lot of user groups and categorized feedback on what are all the types of feedback for how people are saying the app had uh, a bad experience or there was a, a poor experience. Um, so uh, this wasn't necessarily whether they liked using the app or not, um, whether, whether they, it was an app that they, uh, they liked the content, but really you know, if, if they wanted to use this app and if they were trying to do something with this app, would they come back to it? Would they use it again? Um, did they think it accomplished the goals uh, correctly? Um, so we ran a bunch of user studies uh, and combined the results into these six categories. Um, so um, this is what we call the, uh, the user experience uh, genome at Headspin. Um, these are areas that we actively look at for all the data um, to, at a high level, tag the data with uh, regions that, that users would uh, see as um, uh, suboptimal experiences. So the first uh, we call page load. Um, so page load is uh, uh, either a warm or a cold load. It's just when you open the app or when you, when you can transition from screen to screen, how long did it take for the content to stabilize and uh, become consumable or for the app to become interactive again? So this is a really rough uh, top-level uh, metric, but it's incredibly useful because typically there's a bunch of loading screens and potentially interstitials and uh, different steps that happen before the app is usable. And um, people are pretty good at actually telling you, you know, when the app is usable. They'll just sit there and watch the app load uh, until you know this thing is seems like it can be interacted or consumed. So what our uh, page load? Um, issue here uh, represents is just you know, what a user would say, you know, the time for this app to become uh, consumable. The second is uh, loading animations, so uh, otherwise known as spinners or um, sort of like animated interstitials. Um, these represent some kind of background task or some, something that the app is doing uh, and the user is waiting for, for the app to, um, to complete. Um, typically spinners are uh, almost always a, an issue. So pe when people see a spinner, what we found is it's just typically something that they, they view as a bad experience. Um, um, the, the next type of issue we look for is what we call low page content. So um, th this is aligned with sort of uh, an information theory perspective, but essentially, um, typically, uh, people have a good experience with apps that have uh, high uh, information on the screen. So, for example, if there's blank screens or like like a single piece of text that's not a form or something, there's there's a bunch of edge cases here. Like forms are usually pretty low content, but uh, are interactive. So, if there's sort of these screens that um, are not interactive with with low content, these are typically seen as as poor experience. So, uh, and you'll see this a lot in apps where there's uh, kind of the blank screen issue. So, there's just a blank screen that's standing in for something or a big blank box that's supposed to be filled in with something that's loaded. Um, uh, th this is a um, kind of universally seen as a poor experience. Um, the next is progressive loading. 
So progressive loading is an interesting one because um, essentially, uh, for example, you'll see this a lot in, in uh, carousels or sort of um, lists that scroll really fast where content sort of streaming in sort of reactively. Uh, at some point, there, it starts at kind of a low content and then creeps up to a stable high content. And it's sort of the, the slope and the, the time it takes to go from the low to the high that, um, that's sort of perceived as you know, how long the user is waiting. Um, this is something that users do notice. You know, if it takes too long for you know all the images to load, or for the uh, you know for that profile picture to load up, um, th these are these are noticeable things to users. Um, the fifth one we call responsiveness. So uh, typically, it's good practice, and a lot of design guidelines suggest when the user taps on something or uh, interacts with the screen that there's some visual response. Um, usually, if if there's not a visual response. Uh, that's a sign of a problem. Also, if the visual response is too long, that's also a sign of a problem. You know, it's it's you know potentially just a bad experience, like too many animations or something. So, um, we we actually measure responsiveness and and try to uh, quantify you know when it's sort of either not there or too long. Um, and the final the final category is actually the most um, subjective and interesting, which we call we call generally low quality. So. Uh, particularly in the video, so um, a lot of people understand what this means um, from signals like blurriness in uh, in live video, or blockiness or jerkiness in live video. Um, so wh what we what we do is actually um, indicate that as well um, in the data. So we look for sort of these some of these perceptive signals and, and raise them up for. Um, to help kind of guide in, you know, where users would perceive these. So a lot of uh, live streaming apps, um, media apps uh, ha have these type of problems, as well as communication apps. So uh, you'll see a lot of uh, a lot of these quality issues in, in those areas. Um, the second type of issue that uh, we kind of built out as part of our uh, genome mapping is um, we call uh, uh, kind of hidden signals, and they're client server issues and purely client issues uh, that are root causes for uh, user experience issues. So these are a bunch of uh, anti-patterns um, uh, that, that are affecting the user experience, but that may be hidden because they're sort of deep down in uh, the network behavior or uh, the, the application behavior. And um, um, some of these, for example, are the way that the, the app is using uh, the network stack, the, the way it's uh, using security, the way that the infrastructure is uh, set up, for example, even things like DNS, um, the, the way that content is being served, the, the type of content being served, um, the, um, uh, and different uh, optimizations that have been done on actually the, the server-side deployments. So um, a, a lot of times apps that are scaling globally need to be, you know, become uh, global on the back end. And a lot of issues start to creep up when, for example, the edges aren't keeping up with the, the user base. Um, we also look at graphics and CPU. Um, so so th that's the, the type of genome mapping that, um, that we've been doing at Headspin. And, and next I'd like to show uh, some, some examples of you know, what running a user flow with uh, this type of um, profiling looks like and how, what a single session looks like um, that kind of are the grains that go into an aggregate analysis or um, to kind of guide guide your team. So this is an example of uh, an app uh, um, that's uh, loading. So there's a purple bar at the top that's representing essentially what we consider to be the, the user experience of the page load. And then underneath uh, the purple bar, there's a lot of um, other signals that are being correlated uh, with that user experience issue. Um, that are uh, around the root cause of different network behaviors. Um, this is another example where the purple bar is a, a user experience issue of a, of a page load. So it's taking about 15 seconds for um, this, uh, this app to become fully consumable um, after the user taps the icon. Um, underneath, there's on the left, we have a bunch of root causes that we think uh, are, are actually impacting, you know, that, that aggregate um, uh, user experience, uh, the, the page load. 
Uh, here's an example of just some, some straight up content issues. So sometimes, you know, content's just not optimized for whatever the network condition is. So if, uh, you know, if your app is downloading content for eight seconds um, before it has to load, um, that, that's a pretty clear issue, you know, that, that can be addressed. Um, on the left, there's some other examples like domain sharding, um, slow TLS, which um, is uh, typically a server side issue. Um, and then as well as um, some insufficient caching. Um, so we're seeing the same messages being sent multiple times to the client. Um, so by having <clears throat> this high fidelity PCAP data, um, you can actually uh, start to really dig into what's happening you know, on this network at this time for this user flow. Uh, here's a final example of a, a session where uh, I thought this was kind of interesting. Um, because uh, essentially there's a, almost a two second app load that's um, being caused by uh, ultimately this app is uh, too far away from its target region. So if you kind of look at the handshake times of uh, the TCP connections from the client perspective, they're, they're really long. Um, so uh, this example of the, if this app is actually trying to support users in this region, they should really you know, think about spinning up an edge um, closer to, uh, to users over here. Um, to, to actually make this app load faster. So um, what, um, what we help teams do and how we apply our process is we uh, spin up a bunch of devices um, as part of this global um, data center. We run these user tests, like we load apps over and over again 24-7, or we run uh, critical user flows 24-7. Um, measuring things like you know search, then checkout, or streaming a, a video, or um, whatever you know the the top level metrics of a customer would be, we collect a bunch of these profiles, and um, then what we do is we uh, we put all these uh, this metadata about what was collected, um, as well as the real data um, in a kind of a separate area into a big uh, into a big schema, um, and the schema. Uh, it's sort of the, the beginning of creating these sort of large-scale analyses of app behavior. Um, so we've been collecting um, for the past three years. We have uh, uh, a good number is uh, we can run five tests per device per hour. Um, and uh, what that comes out to is you get over 40,000 um, high-fidelity sessions per device per year. So you know, as you're launching new versions, as um, you're measuring your user flows. Uh, a typical customer can see um, millions of these sessions uh, in a year by deploying, you know, 40 to 50 devices. And um, um, what typically we look at uh, after we uh, we deploy with a customer and create um, create a bunch of sessions is we actually start looking at some of these key dimensions. Um, they're really interesting to kind of start to break up your data by. So one is the, the actual devices that your, your users are using. So you have different devices in different regions. Um, you know, if you look at, um, you know, like the top 10 devices per region, there's, there's some pretty high variation, you know, in different regions. So if your app is, say, working on a, a Qualcomm processor in one region and a different processor in a different region, sometimes there can be variations between those performance differences. Um, so, so looking at sort of the breakdown of devices uh, can be interesting. Um, there's also carriers. So um, um, looking at how your app is performing on different carriers for different regions um, can be useful. Um, uh, also locations themselves, so making sure that for each of your locations you're having sort of a uniform performance. So um, typically what you'll see is some locations are better than others, um, and that just means that w whatever locations might not have been optimized. So maybe your edges are too far, maybe your CDNs are optimized, maybe you have some um, DNS issues uh, for those locations or um, you know, maybe there are actually some some location specific issues. Like there, are, uh, a lot of um, <clears throat> uh, app C issues, for example, in the Middle East in Africa, because there are some uh, unique challenges there. And as you're you know scaling out, um, uh, these these are things to keep an eye on, right? Um, what works well in one location might not actually work well in another location, and this data um, 
through a process like this can help you understand um, from the user perspective what, what's working and what's not working. So we also look at network conditions. So um, there's sort of a natural curve uh, for every location of, of the network um, between peak hours and off-peak. So it, it's actually really interesting to kind of start to look at peak behavior versus off-peak behavior. Um, because even underneath your app, the network's changing throughout the day. And um, uh, so, so are the services that your app relies on. So understanding you know, how, how things are scaling you know, as users scale up, but also the, the environment in which your app is running is changing uh, is, is really important. Um, and having it from the user perspective you know, helps you prioritize how, how you're actually going to start to address, address these issues. Um, uh, a really uh, useful thing to look across is versions, especially as developers go into uh, continuous deployment or sort of you know, continuous rollout of new versions. So making sure that you're accurately benchmarking new versions against old versions. Um, having the user experience data is, is a really useful way um, to, to do that from the user perspective, uh, especially as you're rolling out new features. Um, it's easy to see changes in those six user experience issues. So seeing more spinners, seeing longer loading times, um, or uh, conversely, you know, um, seeing seeing things improve is always awesome. Um, and also segments. This is a really interesting one. But um, essentially, um, looking at other apps uh, similar to yours, um, how they perform, you know, what the baselines are uh, can sometimes be helpful, especially as, you know, design is changing. Um, the amount of data you're trying to show is changing. So uh, it's becoming more and more common to have more autoplay videos, for example, in an app. Um, you know, tracking, you know, how is that actually performing? How, you know, how, how is, the, how is the, the state of design and the state of the app, you know, changing in your segment? And, can, you know, how are you keeping up with that? Or, uh, it is really useful. And these are all things you can do, you know, once you can collect the data um, and actually run, you know, run apps, you know, as if you're running user studies, uh, you, can, you can start to collect data, you know, from, from different carriers, different, different apps, and, and understand how they, they work. So what we found is that um, uh, through our study, uh, most apps, uh, the median user experience uh, could be at least a second faster. So um, there's a lot of low-hanging fruit out there uh, that can be optimized for, for most apps, uh, most user flows. And having this type of data that helps your team you know, quantify and measure, and once you make a change, uh, to measure the impact of that change um, uh, can speed up um, speed up results and kind of you know cut down the noise. Make sure that you're focusing on the right problems that um, you really do understand. You know what every user sees in your app and um, can actually um, you know save you a, a lot of stress um, if you have the right process uh, from from having to guess you know what what to fix what to fix next. So. Um, uh, so, so this process um, really starts from um, being able to automate a user flow. So, um, uh, to to kind of get the get a sense of how things work, you can you know manually run user flows. You can hire people to run user flows. But to really get the scale and coverage uh, to collect you know millions of data points, is you need to start um, with some automation. So, so luckily, there's some really awesome open source tools out there um, that everyone can uh, start automating with. You know, it's actually um, not that not that difficult to create automation um, um, and, and actually start automating apps to run through real user flows to see how they're working. Um, so, one uh, one project this is showing is called Appium. So, this is sort of a a UI uh, front end to Appium. So Appium's great because it, it, it requires no SDKs. Um, you can just take load any app and run. Um, so uh, you can take your own apps. You can take third-party apps. You can take system apps. You can, you can automate everything with Appium. And it's really, really, uh, really uh, nice that way. So if you go to the Appium website and download the uh, Appium desktop tool, you'll see there's a tab in Appium, Appium des desktop called Headspin. So that's, uh, that's our tab. So you can hook this tab up to our device cloud, our distributed device cloud, or some subset of that. 
and uh, actually start running tests on um, these distributed devices. So um, what the recording process looks like for, for an Appium is this is this is another this is part of the open source tool. Um, is essentially you see a screen of the device. Um, you see sort of a breakdown of the components in the device, and all this is through the the standard uh, ecosystem provided by um, uh, Android or iOS also. And you can actually start clicking around and clicking on elements, and it's actually writing Python code for you that you can then uh, save into a script uh, and then run any time to, to rerun that, that user flow. So, so this is a very uh, uh, basic way to get going with automation, but it's, it's actually fairly robust and um, is a good way if you just want to plug in a couple devices to a computer and start creating user flows. Uh, this, this is a great way to start. Um, there's a sort of a new direction happening um, right now, um, particularly around games and cross-platform testing and sort of more high-precision testing, uh, which is image-based automation. Um, so uh, as of Appium 1.9, uh, there's some new uh, image capabilities in, in Appium itself, which, which is really exciting. So you're able to actually write tests uh, using image matching. Um, and then there's a really great uh, project called AirTest that is all about uh, image-based automation, and um, especially for gaming. Uh, it's, it's very a uh, uh, little more sophisticated than Appium, but um, it's a great place to start. It's also open source. So um, th these user flows aren't just uh, you know apps with like hierarchies and stuff. You can you can use them on Unity apps. You can use them on games. Um, you, pretty much every app you can write an automation for, and it, it's not um, <clears throat> it's not um, uh, once you start, sort of learn these tools and, and maybe spend half an hour with these tools, you actually start to see that you know creating automation and running automation. Uh, is something that all developers can do, um, and then once you you know start hooking that up to more advanced data collection, um, the 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 ROI on that automation just becomes more and more. So um, we uh, I'd like to reference a webinar that we gave um, earlier this year because I think this is a really great introduction um, into writing reliable automation. So um, oftentimes what uh, people will find is that you can get going with automation, but it's very brittle. It keeps kind of breaks, or you know, things are. There's a lot of like timing issues and errors happening, and it's not really clear how to think about this stuff, right? Because typically, when you're a developer, you think, oh, it's, you have to have 100% pass rate, otherwise, it's you know, like it's broken. But but actually, um, this idea of flakiness, this idea of dealing with unreliable systems, which actually real devices are are very unreliable. Uh, is actually part of the testing um, ecosystem and part of thinking about testing. And if you think about it, you can actually deal with unreliable tests. You can deal with tests failing, you know, every other every other run, and still get useful data. Um, for example, um, so so we uh, we put on a webinar earlier this year on YouTube, um, and we actually did this with uh, 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 part of the the the. Uh, someone who creates created Appium and maintains Appium, the lead architect Appium, and um, he actually went off and um, created a nine-part tutorial series um, about every everything in this webinar. You know how to start really thinking about real-world automation using real devices. You know how to get real data from automation, and uh, you can find that on this um, this Appium Pro link down there. That's the first of the the nine uh, series. So um, examples of what, what it means to uh, manage flakiness is you, you can take the same, um, uh, the same test scripts and run them and get uh, totally different results. So here um, I'm running tests on, uh, this is like uh, some notation that means one location, one device, four network conditions with one carrier. Um, and I just ran this test four times and um, the green means uh, it passed. The the gray means there was some kind of uh, system failure, so like a, a test framework failure, uh, and the red means the, the the user flow just logically failed. So um, so this is pretty typical. You can run this and you get all these sort of these noisy things. Um, so what we found is useful is 
uh, to really think about testing as more of a stat statistical uh, process, not a um, purely deterministic process. So Ashley's starting to define um, thresholds like the minimum number of pass tests, the maximum number of failed tests, the maximum number of system errors, and then working within those statistical thresholds until you meet some threshold, not so much trying to get absolute, you know, 100% pass or whatnot. And um, when you start thinking about testing like that, um, you can actually start um, creating statistically useful and um, systems that will uh, th that you can you can maintain. Um, so uh, this example of basically taking an Appium script and um, running it on uh, a Jenkins instance. So Jenkins is a, a, a continuous integration platform. Uh, it's open source as well. So all these tools are open source. Um, and uh, typically what happens is you take your Python that, that was uh, produced by, um, by, by the tool and you put it into a, a Jenkins workspace and what happens is um, the script runs, it connects to a device that's connected to the, the integration server, uh, and it runs the script. Um, and then uh, the script finishes, Jenkins saves some results, and typically here's where you would, for example, write into a database or sort of track the, the progress. Um, so it's perfectly fine to get going with uh, automation um, by just basically maintaining a Jenkins box. Uh, and plugging some devices into it and writing scripts um, with uh, Appium Desktop or Airtest, um, you can actually start getting some results um, this way. Um, what we uh, build Headspin to do is sort of take that and sort of uh, make this process much easier. So um, not only provide the devices, provide the debug connection to the devices, um, but also um, have this 24-7 uh, data collection on top of the devices and, and the tests that you just run a test, you get data. Um, so um, uh, th that's something also once, if you get further into testing, you start actually seeing that you can, how easily it is to automate these user flows. You can uh, work with a partner to actually scale up your tests, get more data, you know, get more, uh, more coverage, uh, and um, tr try to make this into a, a a practice that your team can use to make better decisions. Um, so, so that um, concludes my talk uh, about continuous experience monitoring um, and the process we built at Headspin. And um, now, um, uh, any questions? Um, I'll have them pass the mic around. Thank you. Yeah, great question. So the question is, um, in the presentation I mentioned, being able to take your data and slice it up, uh, compare other apps in your segment. And the question is, um, particularly around design, how um, you can quantify design uh, and how design is changing uh, for similar apps to yours. Uh, so, um, so, so one thing that is really interesting as you look globally is, the design of apps, for example, in Asia, is very different than the design of apps in uh, North America. So um, in Asia, there's a lot of autoplay. There's a lot of you know content that's sort of automatically sort of streaming in, and um, a lot of sort of the state of the art of apps right now in North America, for example. Um, let's just take uh, like social apps is very uh, intentional. Like you have to tap on something to to view it. Um, and you see some apps like Netflix, for example, starting to move more into like everything's auto-playing all the time. But obviously that requires more bandwidth, requires maybe a different back-end design, right? Because now you have a lot of videos streaming in. Um, so so that's, that's really kind of what I meant is, uh, for example, if you're, um, if you're a travel app and you want to take the other top five or top ten travel apps, you know, how are they approaching user engagement? How is the user experience? Um, and is your you know is your app you know achieving a similar result? That's what I meant. Okay. Um, so yeah, um, this slide will be part of um, the, the standard deck. And thank thank you everyone for attending.